session. Uh, yeah. I'll, in addition to the open problem session tomorrow, I'll try to compile a list of open problems from various talks. Uh, it's possible that I might bug you once more uh, to, to check some problems about your talk. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, so I'm going. So uh, one of my favorite metaphors for for math is this kind of bowl of spaghetti because you never know where things are going. And so like this is a project that sort of began as trying to pick apart um, one some things that I'm interested in and having them lead to a whole bunch of other things. And actually in the, in forming these connections, I was also like following the trail of Rheingold, uh, Trevisan, Tulsiani, and Vedan. Um, so, um, but uh, I extended the, the path of connections a little. And this is kind of like joint work, pro this is work in progress that's kind of the set of final authors has yet is yet to be determined. <laughs> so it's not all, uh, I'm doing things with different people and I don't know uh, what's gonna come of it. <laughs> so um, anyway, so as I said, like we try to like divide up our, our areas into in mathematics into different sub areas and each like pick a part of it to, to concentrate on. But what really happens is uh, when we, the divisions are, are artificial and you see that everything is connected. Um, so, uh, and this is like one example where um, I'm gonna show you something that seems to connect uh, in an abstract framework, a bunch of areas that you, that you, you know, mostly results that you've already know about, but that seem disconnected or maybe seem disconnected. And, and the general theme is kind of like high level structure versus low level randomness. So um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of times we like take some uh, mathematical object and you say, well at a high level, some kind of global level, it has some kind of structure. But once you mod out by that global structure, the, at the local level it looks kind of random. Um, so we want to like come up with, we have some kind of object and we want to come up with some kind of decomposition into the high level structure and then model the low level parts, the details, as random. Of course they're not random, they're a fixed structure, but we want to like say that the sort of like a random model gives us as much information as we really need about it. So, uh, so look at this as a kind of abstract setting, there's some kind of probability distribution D that we're trying to understand, okay? And that may be like splotches on the canvas or um, outputs of a pseudorandom generator or, um, or edges in a graph, okay? Um, and there's some kind of prior distribution U that I think of as a uniform distribution on a set, but m almost everything I'm gonna say is, is kind of makes sense for any kind of prior distribution. Okay? Um, and then we, wh what do we say, you know, when we wanna like model things in a way that, um, that still codes everything we're interested in, we have to kind of characterize what we're interested in. So we characterize what we're interested in as a class of Boolean tests of objects, and what we're interested in for the distribution is the probability under that distribution that an object uh, satisfies this test. Is okay. And all I'm going to assume about this class of tests is it contains the is closed under complement and it contains uh, the constant functions. Uh, for now, you can think of them as Boolean tests, but actually like um, real value tests. Um, as long as they're bounded, uh, everything works pretty much the same. Okay, so, um, so D might be complicated. So what we want is a simple model, like understanding D, we want a simple model of D, which is gonna be another distribution that, we, that is in some sense simple, okay? And where um, this new distribution is a model in the sense that for any test, whether it's one we've, we've looked at before or not, the expected value of that test on D and the expected value of the test on D prime 
are very close. So, um, so what is, say so we want a simple model. Well, simple here is going to mean definable in terms of the same class of tests um, in a small number of the same class of tests that, that, we're, that we're interested in. Okay. So, um, so maybe more precise, because we're going to have like different constructs over that class of tests. So we might have like a class of outside functions, g. And uh, then I'm going to use this cumbersome notation, because uh, I'm still getting used to this to uh, the, the slide making PowerPoint slides. <laughs> um, GKT is going to be the class of all functions where you have some G that has K inputs from this class G, and you have K tests from T, and you compose the, the K tests with this, uh, this outside function. So you don't have any kind of direct access to the input except through these kind of filters of these, these simple tests. Okay, and um, in um, one kind of class of so these may or may not be Boolean functions. Like if the outside function isn't Boolean, this might be a real valued function. And one class of uh, when we say a distribution is of this form, I'm actually going to use a, a slightly different. Instead of having the distribution directly, what I'm going to have is computable of this form is a measure, which is going to be a function from the support of u to 0, 1, the interval 0, 1. So it assigns every, every element a, a number and it says, like, sort of, what's the weight under the distribution? What's, you know, the uniform distribution, everything would be equal, like weight 1. If we weight some more than others, then uh, then we induce a distribution proportional to the weight. And you can think of the distribution as pick x from u, and then with probability u of x, keep it. Otherwise, throw it away and start the sampling process over. And that will pick a, an element with probability proportional to u. Now, the time of this depends on the expected value of u of this process to do one to produce a sample, expected time, is going to be 1 in the, the average value of u. Um, so, uh, so we want u to be dense in order for this to really give an efficient way of producing samples from this distribution. So we, we define the density to be the expectation of u of x where x is drawn from the, um, from the base distribution. OK. So, um, so, you know, this is pretty abstract, but there are lots of examples where you can think of is maybe we're trying to understand some distribution of points on the plane, maybe even like a continuous distribution, and the tests that we're trying to, that we're trying to study are straight lines that divide the plane into half spaces. Okay? And then, uh, actually, maybe I'll just draw a picture. Like maybe we have some distribution, sort of looks like this. These are the, you know, hot areas of the distribution, and we'll come up with a simple, a simple model of this distribution would look like something like this. And maybe we would like give each of these areas probability zero, and then give the uniform distribution uh, of how much have I used? 0.9. You know, some probability on each of the these other regions, and then within a region would be the uniform distribution. So that would be why um, if we, oh, I think I've just been accidentally squeezing the trigger here. Uh, so that would be why, um, what it would mean to have a simple, a simple model of this distribution. Okay. And, and what we'd want is to, if you draw any other straight line, that the model 
in the actual distribution have about the same probability uh, fraction of mass on both sides of the line. So then, um, but it com comes up in, in complexity where we want to look at distributions that look to computationally bounded adversaries like other distributions. Like in pseudo-random generation, you have a distribution that's of the outputs of the generator. You want to say it looks like the uniform di distribution. Well, that's kind of a simple degenerate case. Uniform distribution is just, is just the original distribution u. Don't have to use anything. But if the distribution sort of looks like it has more randomness than it does, has pseudo entropy, then, um, then you might want to like a simple description of a model that, that explains what, this, this, uh, what the outputs actually look like. Okay. Or it um, comes up in additive combinatorics where you have some kind of subset, you have a set of all integers up to n, and, um, and you have some subset of the integers that you're trying, or distribution on the integers, like random primes, that you're trying to understand. Um, and you might have a like, more complicated class of tests. Um, so, uh, or in graph theory, um, you have the, a graph that you're trying to understand, a very big graph you're trying to understand. And so you think of the uniform distribution as picking an edge in the complete graph at random. And you're comparing that to picking a gra an edge from your graph at random and trying to come up with some kind of model that, ex that gives approximations to cuts, uh, properties of the form, given a set A and a set B, is does the edge go between A and B? So, um, okay. and, and lots and lots of other examples, you can, you can just make up your favorite example. So like, oh, a distribution on strings, and we're looking at tests that only, that are, are K huntas. That's a good example. Uh, I like that one, but I don't know that anyone's actually interested in it. Okay. That was unexpected. Uh, what did I do? <laughs> no, it's still on the, the computer. It's just, I disconnect. You escaped out of the. Out of Okay. Okay. Huh. Okay. So, um, so I'll try not to do that again. Okay. But this is sort of like the general picture of where we're going, kind of clear. So there were lots of, from different areas, there were, uh, there were lots of different kind of theorems that said you can do this kind of decomposition into a high level. Um, structure part and a, and a low level random part. Um, so to like state some of these, I have to talk about some, a concept called pseudo density. So we have this uniform distribution u, and density is like how big a fraction of u it is. So um, if you have another distribution d, you say it's going to be like a d fraction of u means that any test, boolean, you know, zero, one test on u should have at least, well, whatever, if you know, with probability d, sort of a sample of u is, is really subsampling from d, well, probability d, the, it should contribute at least the conditional probability given that you're in s sub d, the s sub d that given that you're in d. And then if it's boolean, outside of d, if you're not from d, then it's contributing something positive. So this is a lower bound. And so this characterizes when, when one model is dense within another. Okay. So this is actual density. And pseudo density means you can't refute this in a way that's, that's simple and efficiently verifiable. So um, you say, well, so that means that for any of these tests that we care about or from our family of tests, that T of U is almost as big as D time, what it should be, D times T of D. But we allow the slack E because if it's just an infinitesimal less than that, then it would, even though, you know, even if someone gives you the test, it would take you a long time, a large number of samples before you realize that this was a, this, this was a violation of density. So we'll put in the slack parameter E. 
as an approximation. Okay. And one way to be pseudo-dense is to be actually dense within a distribution that looks pseudo-random, that looks like the uniform distribution. And this was like the, the more traditional way people defined it, but I prefer this way. Okay. So um, with that, with, now we have the, the groundwork for, uh, for saying what the three different styles of decomposition theorem are. Did you have a question or? I did, but uh, if you're worried about time, I'll, I'll hold it. No, I, I, you just held up like three fingers and I was just, that worried me about time. I thought you might be the chair of the session or something. <laughs> <laughs> Could you say something about the difference between the, the two, like you said, the, so the one on top is more general than the one on the bottom? You said, this one? No, no, dot, uh, dot three and dot four. Dot three and dot four. Oh, okay. So um, if modulo, once you prove the main structure result, you can retroactively show that they're equivalent, oh, okay. but <laughs> you actually need the result about, that uses them to show that they're equivalent. And they're not, and, and it's only kind of like approximately equivalent. It's not quite the same class of tests. Um, so, um, okay, so this is where I got involved. Is, uh, first kind is called a hardcore set lemma, okay? And what it says is, say you've got some Boolean function that's hard to approximate within, uh, by a test that we care of the simple kind, okay? That means that, um, that there's no function f um, that's simple, um, a small combination of functions from the class that almost always computes the value of the function that we care that we're trying they're interested in. Okay. So um, so if this is not true, then we get what's called a hardcore distribution. That's like a a set of subset of size 2D fraction of 2D, so real density 2D, on which um, F is almost unpredictable. So outside this hardcore set, F might be very simple, just given by one of the, the, the functions in the class, but inside there's no even like real correlation with any function in the class. So that was, that was one result. I proved a version of this, and then Holenstein gave a, a kind of optimal version of this. Um, and then there are many different proofs of this, and we'll see that many different proofs also tie in with many different proofs of other things that we're interested in. Okay, so the second one is called a transference principle I knew it as a dense model theorem, that's hence the name of the, the, the talk. Um, so this was by uh, Green and Tao implicitly, but then Tao and Ziegler made it explicit, but also um, Barack, um, Chaltiel, and Wigderson had an equivalent version uh, in complexity terms. And these emerged from uh, additive combinatorics um, looking at Actually, the, the arithmetic progressions within the primes was the original motivation. But uh, what it says is, is kind of abstract. Um, it says if, if D has this pseudo-density property, okay, so there isn't this kind of uh, characterization, you know, very strong witnessing that, it, that it, it's just a small fraction of the universe, um, then uh, there is a a model uh, that's indistinguishable from it according by these simple tests where the model looks like it's dense. Is model is actually dense and it's indistinguishable. So if you don't, if there's no giveaway that you're not dense, then there's a model that is dense that looks like you. Okay. And this was used to like, here like the set they were interested in was the primes and having a, a, a dense model of the primes gave them uh, the ability to use Zemmeretti's theorem on that model. Okay, and then transfer it back to the primes. 
So what we get from this result is this kind of dichotomy for any distribution. Either there's this kind of like very small region of the space that has a much higher probability under that, under that, under that distribution than it would in the uniform distribution, small in U but big in, big in D, or there's this kind of spread out distribution, even though the original distribution is kind of small, there's a spread out big distribution that looks like the, the distribution according to our simple class of tests. Does this make sense? Okay. So, um, so that's another style of decomposition theorem. And then uh, a third style uh, came out of uh, out of uh, graph theory um, called regularity lemmas. Um, so the one I'm talking about, so there, I'm going to get back to the, there's like the, the uh, you know, there's what would make sense and what actually happened. What would make sense is that there's a weak notion of regularity by friesen Kanan that was later extended by Zamoretti to give you a much stronger regularity lemma, but at the expense of being going from a, an exponential to a, step, a pile of twos. But what actually happened was there's a strong regularity lemma that was weakened <laughs> to give a quantitative improvement much later by Friesen and Kanan. But um, uh, I'm mainly talking about the weak version, but I'm going to say a few words about the stronger version uh, in, in a couple of minutes if I have time. So, um, so it says that, well, if D is actually dense, then there is a model that's simple uh, for, for D. Okay. And it actually, this, this step, there's already like an obvious connection. Because this dense model theorem is saying either you get a witness that the, the distribution isn't dense, or you get this kind of model. And the model turns out to be simple. Okay. And uh, what the regularity lemma says is, well, if you're actually dense, you can't have a witness that you're not dense, <laughs> so you get the model. And you know the model is big, but we don't really care about that. We just care that it's a simple model. So it's just kind of like a degenerate regularity then you can see is like a degenerate subcase of the dense model there. Okay. So, so what I, what, or where do we come in? So what we're going to show is, uh, I already sort of hinted, at why a dense model theorem in a totally um, straightforward way gives you a weak regularity theorem. But we also get um, such a direct connection between hardcore set theorems and dense model theorems. And uh, one thing I want to point out is these, when I, when I call them like uh, the dense model theorem, really what this is is a family of theorems, because there are all sorts of different parameters in this theorem, mainly the K, how many tests you need, what, what class of, and then you have two class of functions that glue together the, te the tests. And um, for different applications, different ways of gluing them together are, are important, or sometimes it's just the number of tests that you need that's important. And so you want to like a trade-off between the simplicity here and the value K. And sometimes you want even like very particular classes of functions that, that you care about. So when I say that there's this generic connection, I mean with the same class G, the same class H, and the same K. Whenever you have GHK hardcore, you have a GHK dense model and a GHK, actually the G disappears, but the H and the K stick around for regularity. Okay. Moreover, all of the reduction, steps in the reduction, are totally algorithmic. So if you have an algorithmic hardcore set theorem, you get an algorithmic dense model theorem and an algorithmic weak regularity theorem. Um, so I need to clarify what algorithmic means in this context. And actually, it was observed by uh, Clivens and um, uh, Servidio, thank you, that what, what algorithmic hardcore set really means is boosting. And boosting 
is a very successful technique from machine learning that was introduced by Shapira and then um, sort of perfected by Freund and Shapira, um, where you put together weakly correlated hypotheses to uh, a phenomenon you're observing to, in order to create a very strong explanation for the phenomenon you're observing. And that's very, if you look at what's happening in the dense model theorem, we're saying if you can always, on every you know, dense, uh, sorry, if you, in the hardcore set lemma, if on every big subset of the inputs there's some way of, of ha the having a correlation, then you can put them together and almost always compute the function. So it's, it's actually a one-to-one -one correlation with boosting, and in fact, in my original paper, I used a, one of the proofs of the hardcore set lemma, I used a, a, a boosting algorithm without labeling it as such. Okay. So, and because it's such a successful technique in machine learning, you have all sorts of different boosting algorithms around, and we can, because it's a generic con connection, we can pick our favorite boosting algorithm, and now I have actually five minutes, this is, um, and, uh, and use that one. So it actually gives us a wide variety, you know, the starting point can be any boosting algorithm, and so we get a wide variety of, um, of dense model theorem, algorithmic dense model theorems, and algorithmic regularity lemmas. Okay. Uh, so, um, okay. So, uh, you know, and um, it's very generic. So if you want a dense model, if you want a regularity lemma for sparse graphs, you just say, oh, I'll make you be sparse graphs. If, uh, if I want um, a dense model theorem where, a regularity lemma where, edu where things are proportional to degree of vertices, I just have an a priori distribution proportional to degrees of vertices, and you get exactly the same thing. So you can just like plug in and get all sorts of versions of regularity lemmas, that most of which we already knew, but um, if you wanted some new ones, you could just go through, plug, plug it in and, and pull the cr crank. Okay, so, um, and uh, we, we can, this only gives a generic result for weak regularity, but um, I also have been looking at um, reverse engineering the, the Zamoretti regularity lemma, and you can reverse engineer a version of boosting that's much less efficient, but, um, but uh, basically corresponds to the, when you push it forward, corresponds to the regular regularity lemma. Okay, so, um, okay, we can also do some, some like tricks building on top of these decomposition, algor uh, these decomposition algorithms. So for example, if instead of, instead of either finding an area of where, the, where it says that the distribution is, is much denser than it should be, or finding a model, what we can do is like continue to finding areas where the distribution is very dense until there's none left, and then find a model for what's left. So we get this kind of generic decomposition into the dense part in a small region and a model for the for the what's left, and that works for any distribution without assumptions. Um, and we can even use this idea recursively. You have a model for what's left, a small region, then you have a model within that small region and an even smaller region, and so on. And so you can get a, uh, a model for uh, a dense set. This is going to, hierarchy is going to have like a logarithmic number of levels. And so instead of having uh, complexity growing polynomial in 1 in E and 1 in D, you have complexity that grows polynomial in 1 in E and the log of 1 in D. Uh, okay, so th these kind of actually we can go back to machine learning. We started with, you know, the, the ideas came from boosting from machine learning, but we can actually use this to go back to things that machine learning people have started being interested in. And uh, one big uh, new idea in machine learning is called generative uh, adversarial networks. You think of it as uh, two learning algorithms competing to understand a distribution. So one learning algorithm is trying to forge things from the distribution. 
The other is kind of like an art critic trying to tell the difference between the forgeries and the real things. And these two algorithms compete with each other to either find a way of generating things that fools the, the, any kind of critic or um, find some way of classifying, uh, really pinpointing what is genuine art, what makes genuine art. So yes? Which one is the ultimate goal we should be? Well, so usually they want to, you know, the ultimate goal is forgery, I think, in most of the applications. But here we're kind of agnostic. What we can show is what, what of course, you know, this situation actually corresponds to the dense model uh, lemma. And when you use it in dense model lemma, then uh, what it says is that either there's a strategy where, the, where you know, one or the other wins. If the critic wins, then that's a very narrow strategy, the narrow, narrow, very narrow criteria that's not true of many things from the uniform distribution, but is true for most genuine art. Okay. If the forger wins, that gives you a distribution that's indistinguishable from, from the original. So if we look at it through the lens of dense model lemma, that sort of like says that we don't know which side is going to win, but either way, it tells us something very interesting about the distribution. Um, and if we, we do a, one thing that the, the of interest in GAN, I'm told, is to have uh, models of highest entropy. So uh, if we do a, like a little twist in the, in the algorithmic dense model theorem and use the actual distribution as a possible distinguisher test, then we get what I call self-reflective GAN algorithm, which is guaranteed to have approximately the highest uh, possible um, entropy of any model. OK. Uh, and using this, going back to complexity, we can go from GAN to back to complexity and complete our, our, bowl, our tour of this bowl of spaghetti um, in a loop and uh, give a characterization for computational entropy. Um, and I think I ran out of time a couple of minutes ago. So, um, so all I'll say is that these kind of connections allow us to draw on this kind of vast literature of machine learning to prove mathematical theorems and allow us to draw on mathematics to design new machine learning algorithms, or at least to understand the ones that are out there. So I think this is uh, a kind of exciting connection that uh, sort of draws in the whole plate. Okay, I didn't, you know, we could even extend the, the bowl a little bit more. Uh, a lot of these boosting techniques are actually, um, you can think of as strategies for finding approximate solutions to zero sum games. So it's no, and going directly through zero sum games is an alternative, non constructive proof of most of these things. So it's not surprising that. Uh, people also think of GAN as, as zero-sum games. Okay. Next talk of the